You have an above ground basement. Um, it is on a uh, lake, so yep, less beyond measure. But with that comes some dampness and occasionally actually some water coming into the basement. So we had to do a major review. So that's just to give you a general idea of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking a project about a, a project with tile and a project with carpet. So let's just do a general overview about uh, why we would be doing this uh, in a basement. Um, but uh, before we go into that, I'm being reminded we have to talk about the fact that uh, we want you to ask questions. Uh, so that's the whole key about being live here. We want you to engage with us. We have always sent out um, uh, emails asking for people to give us questions in advance. We've got some great questions mm -hmm. today. Uh, one of my favorite came from Les, and Les actually wants to know, I mean, technically, something really important, which is, what's your favorite color? We want more Les. <laughs> I love it. My favorite color is blue. I'm really in a blue period. Anyone who comes into my house will know that. So thanks for bringing some lightness uh, into the, today's presentation, Les. Love the, the question. Makes it very personal. Uh, but let's move on from there. We're going to be answering a lot more of those questions, but let's, in general, talk about why are we going to heat a basement? Well, the reason why you're going to heat a basement is because in the wintertime, basements can be very cold. And a lot of the holidays that we have in North America center around Thanksgiving and Christmas and those sort of type of celebrations, and those just happen to be in the winter. And when you have big celebrations like that, you tend to have a lot of people that come over. And sometimes those people get put into the basement. Overflow well, area. Overflow into the overflow area. But okay. the thing is, if you get this in your basement, no longer does it become the dungeon that the family members have been used to, mm. but now it's someplace nice to go hang out and sleep down there. So what it does, is it actually increases your living area in your house, and it makes space that you already have usable, and that helps in your resale value. Excellent. I mean, my personal reasons for that was my basement was always, I had that smell. I don't know if you've been in basements that have that smell, but it had that smell. Um, it, you know, um, hadn't been renovated probably in a good 15 years. So it had, you know, that dampness. Um, so I wanted to get rid of that. Uh, I wanted to make sure that if for whatever reason um, we got any flooding, and a lot of people are concerned about flooding uh, right now, that um, I had a flooring type like tile where I couldn't uh, limit the damage. Uh, so that was a reason why I wanted to heat my basement. Um, and of course, you know, I'm always looking to provide warmth and comfort for the family. So comfort was number one as, well, number two, number one was mitigating those damages for water. And you also want to use materials that are rated for below grade. Mm. Most of the time your, your basement at least some or all of it is below grade. Yeah. So obviously that's going to eliminate some flooring choices that are not designed to be used in below grade areas. So, so those are the reasons why you'd want to heat a basement. Uh, some of those are personal, some of those just in general. It adds value to the home, gives you more square footage that's livable all and year so, round. Yeah. And uh, makes the, uh, yeah. So now let's talk about, uh, we, we're gonna heat it. We're gonna heat it with electric floor heating. And why would we be doing electric floor heating versus maybe hydronic or maybe just putting in some type of space heater? Well, electric radiant heat is much easier to install, much less expensive because you're not putting down tubing. You're not pouring concrete okay. on top of concrete, on top of tubes, which raises your floor one, two, three, four inches maybe. Um, it, you know, there are no boilers. There are no pumps. Yeah. There are no manifolds. There's not a room that's a mechanical room that has to be dedicated to um, to hot water. If you've ever walked into someone's basement, do you see their hot water tubes and their pumps and their manifolds out in the open? No, they're put away in another spot where that takes up even more space right. that you can't use for living. And, and a lot of these are retrofits. These are remodels. Most people that are installing electric floor heating are doing it after the fact, just, just as I did. So um, that flexibility, that ease of installation, mm -hmm. that minimal floor height becomes very important uh, in a remodel. So. Right. And every year you're not going down there flushing a system. You're not replacing a blown pump. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there's none of that. It's you turn it on and you enjoy it. Nice. Okay. So that's the why for electric floor heating. And what we want to just talk about now is 
there, you know, we talked about the reasons related to uh, for height, but there's also a comfort there. Don't be a hothead. Okay, because <laughs> if, you, you to say. <laughs> if, if you were in my basement, it's like the Sahara Desert, three feet up, and it's like the South Pole, three feet down. Okay, so that's the illustration the one on, the left. on the left. Right, most, most basements have forced air heating from above, and that air comes down about halfway down the room, and then it goes right, right back up. up. So if you are in a basement in the Midwest, and it's 10 degrees outside, or 10 degrees below zero outside, your feet are going to be very cold, and your head is going to be either very comfortable or very hot. The good thing about putting the floor heat in is it is keeping your feet warm. Your feet are no longer freezing. Right. If you have children, children a lot of times spend time on the floor. Absolutely. Um, and pets as well. Yeah, yeah, and pets love being down there. So what you're doing is you're heating the entire space from bottom to top, not the entire space, just the upper third. Love it me. makes a big difference. Okay, so big difference in comfort level. Yes. Great. All right. So, um, like I said, we're going to be talking about two different projects here, one tile based um, and one carpet based. It's very important from the get go that you understand uh, the flooring type that you're going to be using. Right. You um, people love hardwood floors. Yes, I do. Hardwood floors are a bad combination for a basement. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of hardwood floors, um, are you'll have no warranty if you install it below grade just because of the water problems. So if you, have a, um, if you have one specific area that is prone to flooding in your basement, but the other areas never see water whatsoever, you can do a mix of two surfaces. You can put carpet or you can put laminate in the area that's never going to be wet. You can even do engineered wood in um, a basement because a lot of engineered wood is okay for uh, subterranean uh, installation but the thing is you don't want to be putting carpet back again just like you had originally in that spot where the water comes in all the time yeah. the main reason be behind that is not only the flooring type you're going to choose but if you look at the product on the left called the temp zone that is compatible with tile stone marble nailed hardwood it can also be used for LVT um, can be used in a lot of different situations and that's simply taking the waterproof pr uh, product it's rated for wet locations. You could actually put it in a shower if you wanted to, and you can put it under tile in areas that you think might get wet because that water is never going to get into that. It's designed to be waterproof. So you're not gonna have any problems with the type of flooring you're choosing or with the type of electricity going through there. And that temp zone heating system is always embedded. Yes, so. yep, and it's waterproof. The, the environment heating system is designed to be used with carpeting in the US only. And it can also be used with laminate or floating hardwood, which means you can have a very easy installation by putting down a carpet pad, laying these big mats down on the carpet pad and stretching carpet over. There's no thin set, there's no glues, there's none of that stuff. Never it's embedded. It's a very, very simple installation. With environ systems, you never glue environ to anything okay. and nothing ever gets glued to environ. Okay. So if you're going to be doing a glued down application, let's say that you want to do laminate, but it's going to be glued down or, or engineered wood, you would take the temp zone system, cover it with self-leveling, yes. give you a nice flat floor, and then you can glue to that surface. Perfect. So determine that flooring type and then we'll do the rest. We'll let you know which system works with that flooring type. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is just a top-down, a bird's-eye view of, of what these two products look like, Tempzone Embedded and um, Environ Floating. And so you're really showing from a bird's-eye view the different layers here. Right. If you want your temperature to be very um, reactive, where if you want to go down and turn your thermostat on and go down there in an hour and enjoy it. I like that. You are not going to want to put that wire on top of the concrete slab. The concrete slab is your enemy. If you want your floors to heat quickly and you want them to get warm, you want to keep away from that slab. And the best way to keep away from that slab is either on the left side, you see the, uh, the dark gray material called Cerasorb, or on the right side, you see the cork. Okay. And so uh, just show me those different layers. From, from the bottom up, that's assume your concrete slab. Well, we're going to be getting into that in a future slide, so let's, let's save that because we've exploded it. <laughs> but what I want you to, to keep notice is the cork insulation is going to be using with laminate and engineered wood. That's designed for areas that are dry because okay. cork is a natural substance. 
mold and mildew can grow and feed on that. Okay. So they cannot do that with Cerasorb. Cerasorb is 100% synthetic. So that's going to be an area, that's going to be something you put into an area that may have dampness and you never have to worry about mold growth because so, of it. So the key for this slide is the fact that you're on a concrete slab, you're in a basement, you're always on a concrete slab, you need to insulate that heating element from that like cold concrete slab right. that's going to suck it's that gonna pull heat. It's going to pull the heat down and you don't want that, you want the heat to go up. Okay, excellent. So we definitely need insulation. Well, definitely. I mean, we talk, unfortunately, we talk to people who never thought of putting it down. We've been the industry leader. We've been suggesting this for years and people are finally starting to catch on that the idea is to keep the heat going upwards, not downwards. So uh, we've really been on the vanguard of, of getting people to think like that. You want the wire isolated from the gigantic heat sink that is your slab. So you were right. Uh, some people were, would say that <laughs> very rarely, but they would say that. Yeah. All right. So we've gone through the installation. Let's take an overview of my project so that people can just get a, a, a feel for um, the size of it, the, uh, the, the uh, wattage that was required. Uh, and later we'll even show you uh, how much that product costs. But it's, I have a fairly large basement. It's, you know, 1,322 square feet. Um, so it was really important for me when I looked at that, um, I wanted to work with the Tempzone cable product. And I wanted to do it specifically with nailing strips. You can install Tempzone two ways, nailing strips or with some type of insulation membrane. Um, because uh, I want it uh, to be able to control my spacing, uh, the further apart that spacing, the less wattage slash amps I'm, I'm pulling. Um, and, I, you know, frankly, the less the, the material costs as well. Um, so I, I chose the Tempzone cable because of its um, flexibility. And um, we also decided, based on some pretty good advice, um, to install Sarasorb. Uh, we are in Illinois. Um, so you can take a look, guys, there. Um, this is a hog. It's a, it's a big basement. Um, so 43.9 uh, amps. Um, again, not your average size basement, but it gives you a general feel for something that is really large. Uh, what does that look like in terms of uh, operating costs? Well, the thing I want to bring up here are the dimensions. If you look at the entire space, that number and Sarasorb coverage are the same mm -hmm. because you're always going to want to insulate the entire slab. Um, that way you don't have to worry about running the insulation over this far and then how, having to build up it with thin set. You just don't want to get into that. Insulate the whole slab, nice. and that's going to be the same square footage as the entire space. Now, if you notice that total heated area is smaller, that's right. because you don't heat right up to the edges. People never, ever stand right up against the wall unless they're trying to hide for a surprise party. But how often does that happen? <laughs> Not very often, so there's no need to heat that. So that's why we've heated 1,100 of those square feet. So if you take um, a, another question that people always, I'm going off the rails here a little bit. Go for it. People always ask, how many watts is it going to take to heat my area? Well, if we look here, this space took 10.5, give or take, 10.5 kilowatts. Right. So if you take 10.5 times your local electric rate, if it's 9 cents, 10 cents, or whatever, I'm not smart enough to do that addition right now without taking my shoes off. But what we can do then is we can just say, hey, I've got 10.5 kilo uh, kilowatts times the rate per kilowatt. And right. that will give you the cost per hour. And that's how that cost per hour came up there, yeah. 84 cents per hour to operate this. Yeah, no, but uh, something interesting about that operating cost is that that is true for like the first hour, maybe hour and a half as it gets up to temperature. But once it reached temperature, it usually kicks in and out about a third. You can reduce that for about a third as it's just sitting there maintaining temperature and of course you also have some residual heat too from that and the thing is in your basement if you know no one's going to be down there for a month you turn the system off it doesn't cost you anything to run it then <laughs> excellent point all right so that's the project overview of course i like everyone i submit a sketch we always recommend that you have a plan um, it definitely helps to uh, make sure that there are no problems on the back end um, it also al allows us to uh, accurately give you the product that you need, exactly what you need. And the thing that people forget is you need, uh, or the, whoever's sending the plan and needs to remember, whatever is sitting on the floor takes up floor space that we can't heat. Right. So that's why we say if there are any drains in the floor, mm -hmm. if there are any vents in the floor, most of the time there aren't vents in the floor in the mm -hmm. basement, sometimes there are. 
Um, also, if there are any expansion joints, because we would prefer not to run over an expansion joint. Okay. And also, the one thing that people always forget to do is they forget to mark the location of support poles or support beams that go into the floor. That's true. Most people, if you look in their basement, they have support beams that support the yeah. first floor and they forget to mark those on the plan. Well, the thing is we can't run through a metal pole. Right. So we have to know where those posts are so we can design the area around that and where those other things are that are in your floor. Yeah, so send us your floor plans. Um, you guys have been doing business with us long enough and know that uh, we will uh, turn that around in 24 hours. Uh, so it's just a small uh, amount of time to wait to make sure you have something that's really accurate. And then you can take that and discuss that with the homeowner and decide exactly where you want that heat. So, uh, so this is my project sketch. And from that, uh, engineering uh, was able to take that and give me, you know, our, our plan for installation. Now, very colorful. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Talk to me about it. And that. we're not going to get into the minutia on this because whenever you get yours, you can take a look at it with, uh, more clearly. Mm -hmm. But what we have is they, uh, they told us where the thermostat is. Uh, we have multiple systems. Each thermostat or power module can only handle 15 amps. Okay. So you can't just have one thermostat running this whole thing by itself. Uh, so what it does, the master thermostat turns on and off the power modules. Mm -hmm. And the power modules are what's supplying power to the floor. So you need to think about in big areas like this, where can I get power to? I need to get power to the thermostat. I need to get power to the power modules, individual runs to them. And then those power modules are situated so that the 15 foot cold leads can get from the heating area back to the thermostat or the power module. So where are the power modules on this plan? They're labeled with P in a circle. Okay. So you can see them there. The thing you want to note is you see the different colors there. It tells you those are all different roll, all different spools. Mm -hmm. So you have different lengths there. The cool thing about our, um, our heating wire that most of our competitors don't have is it has two things. One is a mark in the center, which means if you have a 500 foot long cable, it's marked 250 feet down the cable. It tells you I'm at the center point. Well, why that's so important is if you look at those little red dots on the plan, that tells you where the engineers put the center point. So okay. you can say, hey, my center point is right on. I'm going to fit this area perfectly. Or my center point is way too far away. It's too close or it's too far out. That way, you know, instead of laying out the whole thing and getting to the end, oops, I need to go back and undo half of what I've already done. Right. It's much better at the halfway point. Now, one thing also that our cable has that a lot of people don't is it has a number of feet actually written on the cable of how many feet are left. So it'll go 255, 254, 253. Wow. So you can start doing your math and you can find out exactly where it is. So our cable is, is a top of the line cable um, and it's not an afterthought. We put a lot of thought into the pro process and that is the halfway point and remaining feet on the spool. And the good news is that if you get to that halfway point and you start to realize that maybe something's not working out quite right, um, usually dimensions change. Same Can I tell you why? Why? Fickle homeowners <laughs> like to sometimes go, I would love to put a gigantic jacuzzi in the basement. I love that, that takes idea. up 30 square feet. Well, the problem is if you take a 30 square feet with a big jacuzzi, what happens to this 30 square feet that was going to be heated? Right. All of a sudden we have 30 square feet too much cable. So I'm glad you brought that up, Julia. The first thing you want to do is when you get this order from us, there's a couple of things. One of them we're going to talk about in a minute. But the other thing is, make sure your dimensions that you now have match the dimensions that are on this plan. Because if the dimensions that you're seeing in the basement are now different right. than what are on the plan, that tells you instantly that one or more of the cables is probably going to be too long. And the good news is you and your team are sitting there every day just waiting for those revised floor plans to mm -hmm. come in. Yep. And we get, we get those taken care of very quickly. And we know that those are situations where we have to be fast. Um, so we turn those redraws around very quickly for you. So never hesitate to come to us and say, hey, these dimensions are not working out. We'll try to work with the current product that you have on site, but if not, we can get new product to you very quickly. If you look on the drawing, you can see there's a lot of unheated area in the borders. Yeah. Uh, so when people uh, are having a problem, just give us a call. And what you can do is if you are running, like if you have three or four extra linear feet of cable, well, you can run it into that area along the wall where we stayed away from mm -hmm. to get rid of that extra cable. So you can see all that area around the perimeter that has no cable, right. that area can be filled with the cable and you want to make sure that the cable is at least three inches away from another heating cable. 
Cool. But as long as you do that, if you're six inches off the wall, mm -hmm. that gives you a, a perimeter all the way around the room that you can get rid of the excess cable. Cool. So don't ever be afraid that, oh my God, what am I going to do? If you look there in the top section in the upper right hand corner, you can actually take your cable, start over again, move your uh, heat, your uh, cable strips over a little bit. And now all of a sudden you're adding three inches to every run. Mm -hmm. That's going to use up your extra cable. So guys, that's why this uh, this smart plan, this installation plan is extremely important. It's so. also going to tell you how many uh, amps you're going to be using. Mm -hmm. and so you can give that to the electrician. It gives you an idea of how many breakers you need. So it's all, it's, it's all the engineers good. have all figured it out. When, when people call us up and go, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. I'm trying to figure out which one I put here and which one I put there. I go, just send us the dimensions because we have, we have engineers that think this all the time. Don't even worry about it this we'll figure it out for you right because you've got enough other stuff to worry about like where am I going to buy these materials where am I going to buy instead of trying to design your own floor let our team do it for free right cool um, the one thing I do want to point out this is a large basement again um, and we did decide to put it all on one control and use those power modules because we went over the 15 amp limit for the, the main control but you could break this out to different zones and put it on multiple uh, thermostats. Yeah, and then another thing that people call up and they ask for that we truly try to talk them down from is trying it, let's say that we had this area was split into five different rooms. One of them was a really huge room and one of them was a little tiny bathroom. One of them was a little tiny studio. Right. One of them was a, was a sun porch or something like that. Then you have one control trying to keep the heat in all those different rooms. Big rooms different with more windows have more heat loss. That room is always going to feel cool. The little tiny bathroom is always going to feel hot. Right. So what we try to do is if you're doing individual spaces, is try to get a control in each one of those individual spaces because a little tiny room does not heat the same way that a big area will. Right. So that's why um, sometimes one master thermostat and a bunch of power modules in a bunch of different rooms is not a good idea. Yeah, glad we brought that point up. All right, so that's my plan. Uh, I promised you we were going to get to this slide, right? You did. Here it is. Ta-da! <laughs> Try to maintain some sort of uh, calm here. But what we have now is we have the cross-section of what a tile installation would look like. Okay. Um, if we take a look from the bottom up, because that's the way we have to think when installing a floor, we have to think about what the top layer is going to be, but we need to think how are we going to get there. Okay. So what we're going to do is we know we're going to start with the heat-stealing concrete slab which is saying, I want all the heat, I don't want your toes to be warm. Mm. So what we do is we take that slab, we cover it with latex modified thin set, and then we install the serosorb on okay. top of that. That is then pushed down into the, uh, that's installed with an eighth inch V-notch trowel, we'll go over that in a little bit, and then it's rolled over to make sure that it adheres to the slab. Nice. What we're going to do then is lay out the cables, as you'll see in some of the pictures in the following uh, presentation, and you'll, you'll lay those out, you'll attach those to the serosorb, and then what at that point you put thin set over the top or self-leveling material, mm -hmm. and then you can uh, put the tile on top of that. So that's the sandwich. Yep. Okay. From pretty, bottom to top. Pretty straightforward. All right, so let's talk about my project. I did opt uh, for the serosorb. It is optional, but I did opt in for that. And so first things first. Very few tools are required here. All you need to do is mix up some thin set. Uh, it needs to be latex modified thin set. You need an eighth inch V-notch trowel and a 50 pound roller. And what you do is you need to flatten your floor out. Mm -hmm. Any flooring before you put it down is going to require that the floor be flat. Well, this house has had a while to settle. So one of the spots has settled and it's dropped a little bit. So we did have a ridge going yeah. along the middle and we were able to take care of that with an angle grinder. Yep. And we, we uh, got that down so it was flat. I was and pretty shocked to see that when we yeah, pulled up the carpet. Yeah, and that's going to happen, and you never even knew it would happen. Mm -mm. Um, so what we do next is you get that thin set down on the floor, and then you take the serosorb, push it down in, and at the final point, you use a 50-pound roller to roll over the top. Very nice. Okay, so serosorb, our insulator, is down. And I know that was one of the questions that we got. How do you insulate uh, that heating uh, element from the concrete slab. And that's so, it. And when, right you, when you're installing the serves or make sure you install it in like a brick pattern. Mm -hmm. So you don't have constant uh, seams that go every direction. You just install it like brickwork. Why is that important? Uh, it just keeps um, any any cracks that might come from the subfloor through the slot in between the pieces of serves or mm -hmm. it keeps it from traveling up into a grout line or something like that. So it, okay. it, it does its best to, to isolate the floor from the subfloor. Excellent.
Good tip. Mm -hmm. Well done. All right, so this is your favorite part because you get these calls on the back end, so you want everyone to do their job on the front end, which is? Well, well the reason we're all here is to learn, I think. Yeah. And instead of making a multi-thousand dollar mistake that someone already else has made, that's why we're here to give you this hint. And the main hint is when you get the box, open the box and test the product when you get it. Yeah. Don't wait until you get out to the job site. You have 15 people out there ready to demo and ready to tile and ready to mix your mortar and all that stuff to find out that something happened to the cable when they opened the box. They might have cut it right. with their with their sharp blade. It happens. Yes, and we talk to those people all the time who go, "I'm out here. I just opened the box." Well, my bit of advice to you, and this will save you so many headaches, is if you open the box when you get the box. Okay. Test it with the digital ohm meter and then you know it's good, then it's good to go out the next day or two days later. The idea is to open it up now and say, hey, you know what, I need a new spool because Bill cut through it when he's opening the box. Right. Okay, we'll get that to you so you have time to, good, our installation is next week. So then it works great, but you right. do not want to be calling from the job site and go, oh, you know what, I just opened this box and something's missing or, or something got damaged or something like that. So right. the, the main thing is to test the product when you get it, mm -hmm. then when you before you install it, test it again to make sure that something didn't happen. And then once you're ready to install it, you attach the circuit check and start laying it out because the circuit check is going to yell at you if you cut the wire or if you short the wire. Okay. So you have the the the, the cable in general, you know, went upon your delivery and then during installation, you're suggesting both times. Right. This is for peace of mind for the customer mm -hmm. and uh, CYA for yourself, but we won't go into what CYA oh, is. Okay. I'm going to have to research that. I'm going to Google that. Mm -hmm. All right. So test that system. We're going to now talk about the floor heating in terms of the actual install. Again, I decided to do the cable strips, uh, but you could be doing this without cable strips. Um, you could potentially use an, an installation membrane, although it doesn't make as much sense in this application because we're in the basement uh, and we're using Sarasorb already. Yeah, so, so the cool thing about our product is we don't require you to buy a membrane. Right. You know, that's a huge extra expense, especially in a room this large. Mm -hmm. If you bought cable from another company and they say, well, you have to use our membrane to put the cable down in, right. there's thousands of dollars that you don't even need because the Cerasorb is going to provide your crack suppression okay. and your isolation from the moving subfloor. Cool. So that's got that built in. It also has an R value, which a lot of those membranes don't have. I see. Um, this has got an R value, a really good R value that's published, and it will also allow you to use double-sided tape to attach the cable strips. Perfect. And so what you do is you lay out these uh, double-sided tape, and you put it down, and then you push the cable strips down, and they hold nice and firm. And that you're just stringing then the cable through those strips. And right. it's kind of got a groove, and you're serpentine back and forth. It allows you to space it at three inches or four inches. And those are about the two choices that you want. You start going out to five inches, you're not going to get quite enough watts per square foot. Yeah. Three and four are really good numbers. Excellent. And I went four uh, just because, again, I wanted to reduce the cost and I wanted to uh, reduce those the wattage. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, this project. Let's take a look at the next one because the next one is very important when you start talking about what does this spool look like that we used. And this spool has uh, like four parts. It has the cold lead, which is the non-heating lead, which carries the electricity from your control down to the floor. But at that point, you have to go from non-heating to heating, and that's done in the factory splice. Okay, I see that right in the center the, there. Yep, the factory splice has to be embedded in thin set or self-leveling because it does get hot also. So you need to make sure that that factory splice is not in the wall, it's not in conduit, that's against National Electric Code. Mm -hmm. um, you wanna make sure that the factory splice is buried in thin set or self-leveling. And then you can see the burgundy color is the heating cable. It's right. the part that heats up, and at the very end is an end cap. The thing about the end cap and the factory splice, you can cut the serosorb out to push those down into to allow you to um, tile over. So you do have to plan for that. You have to mm -hmm. find out where your factory splice is going to sit. Right. You're going to cut out the serosorb, put it down in there, and then tape it in place temporarily until you can cover it with thin set. Now, if you decide not to do serosorb, you can notch out uh, a, a, a the chisel. concrete. You yeah, can you can chisel, chisel it out. the concrete, mm -hmm. and, and you can do it that way. It's not easy, but I've seen it done. So if you decide not to use a insulation, that's an option as well. Right. Okay.
Now, if you take a look, here's where we're uh, putting the cable down. We've installed the cable fixing strips. We've put them on the double-sided tape. Now, if you notice, when we're stringing this cable back and forth, we're not doing it from five feet up and pulling on it to make it tight. What we're doing is we're getting it right down next to the floor and pulling it tight because the strength in the double-sided tape is the shear strength, which means the side pull. Okay. If you took this cable and put it up here and I'm over six feet tall, and if I did it like this and I pulled on those strips, it'd pull them right off because they don't have strength like this. Their strength is in shear. So if you can take a look at our drawing there or our picture, notice how the spool is right down by the floor. I see that. Every once in a while, we get a call from a customer who goes, I've been putting on this, and when I pull on the cable to make it tight, it pulls the strips right up. Mm -hmm. My first question is to them, "Is are you putting the spool down by the floor? No, I'm holding it up by my chest. That's the reason why. That's so a great tip. Once again, that uh, keeps you from learning that lesson yourself, is keep that spool low and pull because you'll have a lot of strength in the shear. So you install those cable fixing strips. Yeah, it says locate the starting point of the cable that is on your floor plan. Mm -hmm. um, you've already talked about the circuit check. Make sure that's attached. We've talked about the serozorb where we're going to cut it. Mm -hmm. The splice and the end cap need to be fully encased and thin set. And um, if you if you take a look at this, um, this you really can't tell, but this room is about ten, this part of the room is about ten feet. So we're doing a 10 foot run, 10 foot run, 10 mm -hmm. foot run. Um, what happens is it's even no matter how tight you pull, when you start trying to thin set over that, you're going to start pulling the cables willy nilly. The thing to do is every two feet on that floor, you got 10 feet like this. Right. Every couple of feet, take a, a roll of real thin uh, masking tape and just go from wall to wall. And mm -hmm. that'll hold that section down. Go another two feet, wall to wall. And that tape only has to be strong enough for one application. So okay. you don't have to worry about it. You just make sure that the serosorb is clean, dusted off, and then every two feet you hold the cable down. So it just proves you literally can use masking tape for yep. everything. Yeah, just about. <laughs> but the thing is, you uh, want to make sure, especially if you're doing self-leveling. Yeah. Self-leveling is very, very dense. The cable isn't as dense. So something that is like that, the cable is going to want to float to the top. And the last thing you want is to do a self-leveling pour and then have cable sitting right at the top of that. Yeah. So that's another hint that is going to save you a lot of a lot of uh, time. And that's one of the questions that we got. Uh, we got that question from Paul. We also got that question from Leslie, which is, you know, can you use um, other surfaces than tile? For example, can you do vinyl uh, or some type of... Um, uh, engineered wood, mm -hmm. you know, how would, I would assume that you're not going to be using thin set with that. You need that clean, smooth surface. So that's more of a self-leveling. Self-leveling, right. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about those other applications coming up. So Brilliant. we will get to your questions about that. All right. So this is key. You Do know. not forget that your sensor is in the thermostat box. Yeah. And sadly, this is, it happens and it's really no one's fault. It's just that the sensor is a component of the thermostat. Uh, we do have warning labels uh, to, to you know, alert people that a floor sensor is required, uh, but it gets you know, a lot of things get missed. Uh, so we really want to talk about education. We want to just scream it, you know, loud and clear. Make sure you have that sensor and make sure that it gets installed. If you take a look at the way it's installed, it's about six to twelve inches into the heated area. Yeah. Also, the cable runs between two of the heating cables. Yeah, if that. that, if you see that lump at the end, that's the actually the thermistor there at the end. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that tells you it changed ohms. The hotter it gets, the, the ohms change. And that's how the thermostat knows it's getting cold or warm. The last thing you want to do is not pay attention to this and not tape it down. Because if you don't tape it down and it goes over and it rests against the heating wire, yeah. that heating wire heats up very quickly. Okay. So when you set it for 80, Within a second, that wire gets to 80, it turns it off, cools off right away, nice. goes back to 80. We call that short cycling. Nice. And so if, if you have a, a floor that you've installed and you set it for 80 and you hear a click, off, click, off, and it never gets above 70, 75, the wire, it's, it's measuring the temperature of the wire, not of the heated floor. Right. So that's what we call short cycling, and that's what can happen when that sensor head gets up against the heating wire. That's why it's so important to keep it in between two of them and to run the sensor wire back between 
into that open loop. If you can see, we have an open loop there where mm -hmm. there is no heating cable yep. and they're at present there where that cable goes over. That's very important that you do that. So never ever contact the heating wire with the sensor wire. Cool. And if you do, uh, something happens and that sensor is forgotten, we have solutions for you. Uh, contact us and we'll be glad to help you. Yeah. All right. So this was the, uh, the point that we were going to talk about where, you know, we're uh, covering the heating element uh, and there are a couple ways to do that. Well, if you're going to be using self-leveling cement or self-leveling underlayment, mm -hmm. you need to know that ahead of time and you need to plan for it before you even put the cable or anything down. Because when you pour the self-leveling, um, you're going to nine times out of 10 need primer. So if you look at the bag that you're using for your self-leveling, and it says, must be used with primer, blah, 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 blah. That means you're going to have to buy this bottle of stuff and you're going to have to buy a roller and you're going to have to use that primer before you put the cables down. Okay. So once you do that, if you are planning on using self-leveling cement or self-leveling underlayment, be prepared to get the primer. Okay. So uh, we, uh, we decided to uh, do the self-leveling. Um, and so on that smooth surface, you could put the luxury vinyl tile. Mm -hmm. um, you could put um, anything that requires a flat surface, yeah, carpet, anything. squares, um, yeah. you know, anything. Sky's the limit. So very yeah. flexible. Laminate, insulation. engineered wood, whatever. The one thing you want to do, though, is if, if you're just using that self-leveling and you're going to be getting it and then covering it with something is make sure that it's about three eighths of an inch or a half inch thick. That way it's not too much, not too little. Excellent. All right, and then we installed the tile. No brainer, but uh, any little tips for this part of the install? Um, not really. Uh, the one thing that a lot of people do find is if you're doing the, the, the tile, it, the mechanical levelers are really good for keeping your lippage down. Yeah. So um, that's a good thing to use if you want to make sure that you don't have one tile higher than the other and you're, um, you, know, you don't want to call back from a customer who goes, listen, I stubbed my toe on this one tile right. every single time because you don't want that. The way to eliminate it is to uh, do the method we're showing now where it's kind of like a two-step installation where you've got a nice flat surface all you have to do now is back butter the tile put thin set down and push it in nice. uh, we don't suggest doing it in one step one step would be where you just saw the cable then you come with a bunch of thin set back butter the tile and put it down on there there are tilers who have done thousands of tile jobs mm -hmm. and done hundreds of heated floors that are good at that absolutely but if you've tiled two dozen times and never done heat you still should do it in two steps. If you've tiled 10 times but never used heat, you should do it the two-step two method because it just gives you so much benefit of, of not damaging the wire, first of all, and not dealing with a bunch of lippage. Now, this isn't my tile, but we wanted to show this. Just It's a great shot of you. That's yes, me actually laying tile. <laughs> all right. Um, so floor heating down. It's been embedded. And you've you got could have those... done. You could have done all this by yourself. Me? Yeah. Love I would have loved to have seen that, but <laughs> that's the DIY part, right? That's okay. the part that anybody can do. When you get to this point, when you start getting to putting conduit in walls and whether you need to or whether you don't need to, that's where the electrician is going to come in and go, listen, our local code says you have to use conduit. Yes. So I'm going to put the conduit in, okay? And you are not going, the homeowner is not going to be the one that wants to hook up the main power supply to the thermostat. That's another job for an electrician. One thing, because hopefully they know that the, what the difference between line and load. Load goes to the floor, line goes to your circuit breaker box. But they're also going to tell you how much wire has to stick out of the wall. So you follow your local code. Some codes say six inches, some codes say eight, right. another foot. So they're going to be the ones that say, hey, this is how it goes in. It uses conduit and you have to have 12 inches of wire sticking out of the wall to make your connection. So we've got the cold leads coming up the wall and we've got the in-floor sensor, the floor sensor coming up the wall. And I'm glad you brought that up because the floor sensor never ever goes in the same conduit as the high voltage wire. First of all, it's against code to do that. And second of all, it can throw your temperature readings off. That's true. So you never want to write, even if you have, even if before you get to the conduit, if you're doing a long run back to the thermostat spot, you don't want the heating wire right up against the cable for a 10 foot run up the wall. Okay. You want to keep them separated for that same reason. Excellent. And there's the thermostat we use. I happen to use a, a Wi-Fi uh, control, um, but we have many options there. Touch screen, um, simple controls where you just kind of set it and forget it. 
Um, but uh, so we installed the control and um, again you have to have this part done ideally by an electrician and there's a sensor that's connected to that control as well as the return power leads or the cold leads. Right. Okay. One, one quick hint for you we didn't even talk about on this, prog on this uh, job but if you look at the wires here on the back of the thermostat notice how there's two reds and two blacks. Yeah. Red and black coming from the floor mean 240 volt. 120 volt is, is indicated by yellow and black. So the main reason I bring that up is because when you're opening that box from us the first time and you're looking at the wires and you're testing the cold leads, if this whole job is supposed to be 240 volts, all those cold leads should be red, black, and ground. Yeah. If you have five spools, one of the spools is black, yellow, and ground, Right there, you know, hey, I've got to give them a call because we got the wrong voltage. These things, you just can't mix voltage willy-nilly. The thermostat does not change 240 to 120, nor does it change 120 to 240. It is just a switch. Yeah. Whatever you feed it, it turns on and sends to the floor. There's no conversion. There's no transform, transforming or anything like that. So notice on this picture how there's two reds, yeah. one from the circuit breaker box, one from the floor, and two blacks run from the circuit breaker block box and one from the floor. Perfection. All right, and this is my finished basement. Um, I wanted it to be warm and cozy, so I used uh, a wood-looking tile. Definitely wanted tile in my basement um, because, again, I had those wet, damp, um, mildew kind of conditions. Um, I wanted tile because I knew that that was going to be the best surface if I got any additional dampness, and, and I have. Um, you know, but um, the one thing about this is with the floor heating, I took something that's traditionally cold, that tile, and it's now, you know, warm, it's cozy. I chose a wood format looking tile just because I wanted to add another element of coziness. I, I feel like wood does that. Well, the but, one caveat with a wood looking plank like you have yeah. is that it's a long, uh, a long tile. Yeah. Long tiles are very unforgiving to uneven subfloors. So that's why it's so important to get the subfloor nice and flat um, because now any surface, any, any dimension of your tile that exceeds 15 inches yeah. is called a large format tile now. 25 years ago, 8-inch tiles were right at the edge of that. Yeah. But now because of the, 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 uh, the improvement of thin set, the large format has actually gotten a little bit bigger. But if you have a 4-inch by 15-inch tile, that's, lo that's large format. Large format means you need to have especially uh, flat floors. You also have to make sure you're using a, a large format tile thin set because yeah. it's a different formulation. And you'll also want to check and, sh and make sure that you're using the right um, size of trowel for large format tile and for large format tile thin set. Yeah. So you need to ask the customer. She didn't tell us this, of course. But <laughs> once we found out that we were going to be using a large format tile like this, we knew then that we had to switch up what we were going to buy. We had to get a different trowel and we had to get a different type of thin set. And you had to ground that floor. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Mm, it's all right. But it looks great. Yeah, it looks great. You can't great. even tell where I was with the grinder. Yeah. <laughs> and I really would have loved wood. I, I, I'm a huge fan. But like you said, um, just there are certain conditions that are not going to be uh, good for wood. So this was my compromise. That's where engineered wood would have been probably okay here too mm -hmm. but the thing is if you get water in here again That's like you're key. probably going to get yeah. then it's still a bad it's, it's still a bad just, combination. Yeah, I, I just knew I needed to go with tile. Right. So that's the finished basement. Let's talk again now. Uh, let's talk now about what product was used and, and the cost of that. And as you can see uh, we use uh, quite a bit of cable there even at four inch spacing. Um, I decided to put everything on one control just because it's it's a large open area and so I felt comfortable with that. And it has worked out uh, really well for me. Um, went with the cable strips because I needed that flexibility. I wanted that four inch spacing. And I... I you also got the cost benefit of that too. Yeah. You didn't have to buy an installation membrane for a thousand more dollars. Right. And then I did get the Sarasorb because I knew I wanted that insulation. Um, that thermal break, if you will. I mean, I, we're in Illinois. It can get down to negative. Well, anything. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? The sky's the limit. Uh, and of course, we always have those uh, circuit checks on hand. 
So um, this what came out to $8,619 uh, for, you know, roughly 1,322 square feet. And someone did the math for me, but that comes out to $6.50 per square foot. I mean, the interesting thing is we get this question all the time. How much does this cost by the square foot? Yeah. And that's such a, uh, it, it seems like the natural question to ask, but it really isn't the best question to ask because this large room priced out at six fifty per square feet, yeah. uh, per square foot, smaller rooms are going to cost more per yeah, square foot absolutely. than gigantic spaces like this. So that's why when someone says, hey, can you quote me this by the square footage? It's not really a good, a good estimator. The estimator is for you to get us the dimensions and we can tell you exactly what it is because that design and the mathematicians and all the engineers working on that are all free to you at the end. Just let them figure that out because we did this very large space yes. for like a two over two dollars less per square foot than the other space. And smaller fit spaces, absolutely. So that gives you a general idea of the price. Again, that Sarasorb is optional. Um, if you're in California or, or Florida, and you you know this may not be uh, something that you need, so it is optional. So I could have saved. Uh, maybe half, almost half the cost if I had eliminate Sarah, eliminated the Sarasorb. Not recommended in colder states. You would have called me when it was 10 degrees and go, why is my floor? So, <laughs> and you would have hung up Yeah, it's quickly. like, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, just to give you a general idea of the cost. Um, and now we're going to talk about the fact that you just don't have to do tile. You, and I didn't. I did tile and I did carpet. Um, I have a second room, and we're going to be looking at that uh, in a few moments. But it, it's a ad hoc theater room, if you will. And so I knew that, um, just based on some limited research, that carpet was going to be better for a room where you really wanted uh, good sound. Uh, so I kept one room uh, carpet. And, um, and so yeah, I just thought we'd take the opportunity to talk about these different applications. Yeah, when I was in high school in the 1860s, there <laughs> were a lot of people that had houses built back then that used hot water heat. Okay. Yeah. And they pumped it through the slab. And, and I remember my best friend in high school, he had a radiant heated floor. And it was always, we always were always on the floor because it was so nice and warm. Yeah. Well, that heat was coming from the slab. Well, in our case with electric heat, we're not heating that slab. So you have to keep that in mind. Those people that I used to sleep on their floor all the time was because they had a low R value pad mm -hmm. and a low R value carpet, which let the heat come through it. Okay. Right. Didn't trap it. It didn't trap it. But what we want to isolate ourselves from that slab. So we're going to do something a little slightly different. And that is we're going to put that carpet pad down first. Mm -hmm. We're going to put our heat on top of it. We want that pad to have a high R value. And most rebond, six to eight pound rebond, mm -hmm. has an R value of around two. And there are some that have even higher. But an R value of two is going to provide you a really good thermal break. Absolutely. So that's where we're different than from a heated slab to a non-heated slab is we want high R value for the pad, the heat, and low R value for the carpet. Excellent. So you will be able to go into a store and say, this is what I want, and they will have exactly what you need to do that. Yeah, and I, I did that. I went into my local Home Depot, and um, I just you know shared with them I was doing a, an install with floor heating, and they had pads already engineered for floor heating. So, And I also uh, checked on, on the, with the carpet as well to make sure that there wouldn't be any problem with the floor heat. Right. You need to ask your carpet manufacturer if it is approved to use radiant heat under the carpet. Nine times out of 10, they'll say yes, but they will yeah. say it's okay as long as you don't go over 84 or okay as long as you don't go over 86 or whatever that is. Well, our thermostat sensor is right in the floor. So we're we're keeping the temperature within two to three tenths of a degree all the time. Right. Um, hydronic systems overshoot and undershoot. So they never really keep you exactly right at the temperature. It goes over, then it goes under, then it comes back. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a zigzag type thing. Whereas we keep it right there steadily all the time. And a lot of uh, companies now are realizing is like, if you put a sensor in the floor and you're doing it electrically, it's going to keep the temperature the same all the time. So what you want to do is when she went to the store, I told her, Julia, please do this. Do not buy that carpet that has pre-attached padding. That's right. That Remember. stuff is the stuff that's already on the spool that you can buy by the square foot off the spool at the store. That stuff you want to stay away from because a pre-attached pad is usually foam, and foam is a great insulator that won't let the heat come through. So it's very important 
that we did that. We, we checked the, the floor limits of the flooring manufacturer to see if it was okay or not. And then another thing, in big areas like this, you sometimes are going to have to seam the carpet. Yeah. They don't make That's 30 right. feet wide by 40 feet long carpets. Yeah. Um, and what you want to do then is if you know there's going to be a seam here, you want to put one environ pad here and one environ pad here if you can. And work around those seams. And to work possible. around the seam if you can. If you have to go over a seam, we have a video online that shows you exactly how to seam over the environ. You just have to put a piece of cardboard or a piece of wood yeah. between the seamer. And we had to do that. Yep, yeah. and, and we, that's where we shot the video. So we have a video that shows you how to do that. So it's very important that you do the right thing. And the thing about doing these types, the, the laminate and carpet, much less involved installation, less cost for labor, less cost for materials. Less materials, yes. yeah, it's not embedded, it's, it's right. all floating. The thing to keep in mind with Environ product is you don't glue Environ to anything and nothing gets glued to Environ. So it's a floating system. Excellent. So let's talk about the laminate. The main difference between laminate and carpet, in mm -hmm. this case, carpet you can only do in the US. This is not for Canadian customers. Mm -hmm. But for the carpet, you have to do a one foot perimeter around the heat because that's where your carpet stretcher grabs and moves and then goes down to the tack strip, right. you don't want to be taking that great big heavy car carpet stretcher and dropping it onto the environment and cutting through the cable. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you ever look at a plan, you'll notice there's a perimeter around the heat. Yeah. Um, with laminate, you can go pretty close to the wall, two yeah. inches if you want to, because you don't have to worry about any carpet stretchers or anything like that. And uh, what they have in common is uh, sometimes there are limits by the manufacturer for floor temperatures. Um, you always want to... Uh, avoid those uh, pre-attached padding so they have some some things in common as well. Yeah, take that sample and turn the sample over if you're buying laminate and see if there's foam on the back mm -hmm. or if there's if there's cork on the back because that's like a, buying a brand new uh, floor heat and then just covering it with something that won't let it through. Right. So that's what you don't want to do. So avoid the two things with carpet and, and laminate, avoid items with pre-attached pads. Okay. All right, so let's talk about um, let's talk about my job. So um, I went with uh, Enroll. I think we did a mats and roll combination for this, um, and you know it's a much smaller room, 264 square feet. Um, so of course uh, the operating cost per hour came down to 11 cents per hour. It's on its own uh, control, so it's you know it's only on and off when I'm really using uh, that theater room. So it's very uh, energy efficient and affordable for for uh, I think anyone. Um, so total heated square. Uh, square uh, you're you're getting right into the point I was going to make yeah. here. Someone calls them and goes, "I want to heat a 240 square or I want to heat 265 square feet." Well, we're not going to heat 265 square feet. Yeah. In this case, we're heating 207. Yeah. So it's remember it's it's sometimes anywhere between uh, eighty to ninety percent of the space. Depending so on the room. exactly. So the, the the thing is, you're never going to heat where no one stands. Yeah, and so and that can come down even further in like bathrooms. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually it could be fifty, sixty percent of the space. Right. Whereas these are nice uh, open areas. You're heating maybe eighty to eighty-five percent of the right. space. All right, so that's the overview. Environ product, it's, uh, you know, uh, the amps not so crazy there. It fits on the 15 amp circuit. And here's the, the floor plan. Um, what I love about Environ is it is so quick to put down. Yeah, it's just like throwing a, a, a mat out on the floor. Uh, like a blanket, mm -hmm. you know, you're just putting a blanket down. Uh, each one of these has a return power lead, and those need to come back to... Um, here and here you show the thermostat location. If you look at those six by tens, that, yeah. that's 60 square feet. You can heat 60 square feet in about 30 seconds. It's, and, and, yeah. Whoop, and there you, you just go. install it. Yeah, you install it in about 30 seconds. It's so easy to install. As a matter of fact, for, for my installation, what I did was when the carpet installers came, we literally laid it down minutes before they were going to do their job because we wanted to make sure that nothing hit the nailing strips and when they were doing the seaming we wanted to make sure everything was protected and with this type of uh, product you can do that you have the flexibility to, to just make changes very quickly and work with a crew the thing you want to do is get the electrician involved early on this because if you look at the one two three in a circle yeah um, the mats the power point for the mats is in the corner yeah. Um, if you notice, the thermostat's at the bottom there of the drawing next to the closet. Mm -hmm. That's where the T is. Yeah. So the idea is that you want the cold leads, they're 30 feet long, 
You want the cold leads to come out in the direction of the thermostat. You can flip them over. You can turn them any which way you want to. No, there's no right. up or down. There's no up or down. Yeah. So you could make that power exit point where the one, two, and the three, those circles are representing where the power is coming out. Yeah. So that's why the number isn't in the middle of the mat. So what you would do is you want to make sure that all those points are where they are, not exiting the other side of the room and then go, how am I going to get these cables all the way over to the thermostat? Yeah. So also we know that these cables are about a quarter of an inch thick. Mm -hmm. So we need to notch into the carpet pad to allow those to get back to the wall. Okay. And once they get back to the wall, we know that we're going to have to put a junction box down there. Right at the bottom. Because we have one, two, three, four, five mats that we need to wire all to the junction box. Right. And then we run a single cable up to the back of the thermostat. Right. Um, anything else we should talk about here? No, it tells you right on the plan what kind of circuit breakers you're going to need, how yep. many amps you're pulling, how many watts you have, if you need a certain uh, breaker size. Remember, all these floor controls that we've been talking about have the GFI built into them. Mm -hmm. So do not go out and buy GFI circuit breakers. You do not need them. Good and tip. in fact, they can sometimes Inter be a hindrance. They can interfere. They can interfere with the GFIs. So just use regular. Another benefit, you don't have to go out and buy special breakers. Just keep the regular ones you have. like it. All right. This is the cross section. I like this because it's got pretty colors. They call me shallow. <laughs> but if we look at the subfloor, you've got concrete, you've got carpet padding, and that's just regular old rebond. Yeah. Regular old rebond, as long as it's six to eight pound um, rebond, is going to be perfect. It has an R value, as we said. Anywhere from 1.75 to 2.25, depending on the thickness, we suggest doing a half inch mm -hmm. because you do get a little extra R value there. And then you just put the pads on top, the environ pads on top of that carpet padding, and it floats once again. So um, if you want to, if you're doing a big installation, you can actually tape them together. I've use seen a, that. Use I've a piece that. of tape to hold yeah. them all in place mm -hmm. while you're like covering it. Like on the it. edges. Yeah. I've seen those, yeah. those being taped in. That way if, you're, way, if you're walking over and pulling on the carpet, that sort of stuff, it doesn't start to separate. Mm -hmm. You can just tape them to each other. And then you have the carpet that goes right over the top, and it's stretched over. It's uh, a carpet that does not have a pre-attached pad, so um, it's, it's very good. All right, excellent. So carpet cross-section, I think we also want to talk about other applications like laminate. So pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the only thing that changes is you have cork now and, instead of the rebar. And notice how we didn't put LVT here. LVT mm -hmm. should not be installed over the environment because LVT bends. Mm -hmm. Okay, you need something that's resilient, something that's going to stay in a straight line mm -hmm. because you will have for a little while until the wire sink down into the cork and you get a little relief there, you will, if you don't use a resilient product like that, you may after a while see where the carpet or, or where the where the cable runs or something like that you would right. never feel or never see in laminate. That's why it's really not a good good mesh, match with LVT. So that would be more of an embedded product. Yes, that would be temp zone covered with self-leveling to give you a nice flat floor. Perfect. Then that's perfect for LVT. Okay. So if you look at the subfloor, you've got your cork. Uh, the cork is going to be used in a dry area once again. You yeah. wouldn't want to put this in areas subjected to water because it is a natural product. Then you have the environ over the top. And as we said before, each environ mat has a cold lead that runs to it. You're going to have to notch out that, that cork to allow the cable to get from where that spot is over to the wall. Perfect. And then you have the laminate or engineered wood on the top. All right. So laminate does have sometimes a temperature limit too. Oh yeah, so I've seen you, that, like 82, mm -hmm. 84 degrees. So that's where you're going to make sure that your thermostat conveniently already defaults to 82 yeah, to 84 I, degrees. Um, it's going to 90% of the time comply with the requirements right out of the box. Right, perfect. All right, so that's the finished ad hoc theater room. Uh, and um, again, I wanted to have carpet in there because I cared about the sound quality. It's also, you know, um, I don't know, just looks warm and cozy as well. I didn't have to worry about the damp conditions. Uh, so th I thought this was a perfect application. The floor heating is going to make sure that it doesn't get that mildew smell that you, you mm -hmm. get a lot from carpet. So pretty happy with the results with that. Let's get those speaker covers all on there, would you? Yeah, yeah, I'll get there. <laughs> it keeps children's fingers I, I, from It's like every remodeling project. Yeah. You get it to about 90% and then you yeah. kind of, yeah, you move That's on. <laughs> All right, let's look, take a look at the final cost on this. Um, you know, we uh, we just we used mats on this. We used three uh, six by tens, uh, one and a half by ten, and one and a half by eight. Uh, the control circuit check, as usual, came out to two thousand three hundred twenty-six dollars, which is 
$8.77 per square foot. Again, affordable, mm -hmm. uh, came out a little higher per square foot just because it's a smaller area. Uh, so there, is, there are some savings when you're, you're doing large areas. But the installation time on this product oh, yeah. is it, incredibly yeah, fast and incredibly is. easy. Save a lot of uh, money on materials and labor by uh, doing the environment mm -hmm. uh, under. And then the same days. thing. The same thing is true though. When you get to the point where you need to get the cold leads back into the box, mm -hmm. you need to get that wiring from there up to the thermostat. You need to get the, that's all electrician type work. Yeah. And you want to make sure that you get a licensed electrician to do that, who's also insured. Yeah. And also, you want to make sure that they do it to code. And that's the most important thing: is that the installation is done to local. All right. Well, let's go down and, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you've got the expert sitting in the hot seat. Mm. Uh, and uh, so please ask any questions that you might have. In the meantime, we always like to talk about what's coming up. We do this um, second Thursday of every month. So the next one is going to be uh, an Ask Us Anything Radiant Heat Heating Reveal. So, uh, we really want you to come and, you know, have some questions for us and let's just talk. You know, every once in a while we like to do this where it's not nothing scripted, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, let's, let's just have some back and forth. So we look forward to seeing you guys in a month, um, August 10th, 1 p.m. We hope that time slot works for you. Um, and then I always like to let people know uh, what's going on with promotions. We do have the summer sale. We do a summer sale every year. Um, so from July until the end of August, we're doing an additional 15% off all of our floor heating and under our, under the underlayments, including uh, the Cerasorb and the cork and our installation mem membrane. So a nice little additional uh, percentage off for the summer. And uh, finally, you know, we always want to hear back from you. Give us your feedback. If we're not answering the topic or you'd like to hear more, or there's not enough substance, or you just think we're really great, um, you love his voice, you know, uh, let us know. So please uh, get us your feedback. And I think, you know, contact us. I mean, we, uh, we're here at Warmly Yours. It's, it's really about a personal relationship. You have my email right there, jbillen at warmlyyours.com. I will answer every email that you send me. Um, you can also send it to generalinfo at warmlyyours.com. So uh, connect with us uh, in any way that you can. We're always here for you. So I don't think we have any questions. We got a lot of questions ahead of the game. So I hope we answered all those questions. And, you know, we'll, we'll see them next, next, next month. month. We'll yeah. be here. So we hope you will, too. Take care, everybody. So long. So long.